Life is messy. God's used to dealing with mess. That's how gracious God is. God deals with the messiness of our lives and he cuts us a break over and over and over again. He doesn't immediately punish sin in any of our lives. He is gracious, long-suffering, patient. We find that in the story of Saul. The U.S. government is built around the concept of checks and balances so that no one person can ever have a monopoly on power. Today, we'll learn how accountability within government was originally God's idea, and we'll witness what happens when Israel's King Saul crosses the line, ignores God's command, and assumes full authority. Welcome to No Falling Word with Liam Gallagher. To learn more about this program, to support this ministry, or to receive your free MP3 download of a message entitled Sola Gratia, call 1-800-488-1888. That's 1-800-488-1888. Let's open to 1 Samuel chapter 13 and listen in together as Dr. Gallagher teaches on the importance of obedience in this message entitled Crossing the Line. Well, do take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Uh, We've been working our way through the story of Samuel, come across this character, Saul, first king of Israel. There's a lot of angst that goes around about Saul. I've noticed this. uh, People struggle with the way that Saul is appointed and then disappointed or unappointed or whatever it is, installed and uninstalled or or whatever, and they they wonder whether somehow or other God has set this man up for failure. He was just put in position, but all the time it was God's purpose to knock him down and put him out of the way. It's a bit like the story of Judas in the New Testament. The question is, and it's a good question, was were these people free to make the decisions they made, and and, uh, did God set them up for failure? There's no doubt that the story of Saul is complex, like most human stories. He was appointed king in in the wrong circumstances. This wasn't going by the book, if you will. It wasn't going by the book of God's purposes. The people had come to Samuel, the representative of God, and they'd been the ones who'd initiated the whole thing. They wanted a king they could see, not a king they couldn't see. Wanted a king that would live in a palace, not an invisible king king. God was their king, but they wanted a king they could see and that could lead them into battle because it was just so irritating, waiting till the last moment for God to turn up. And while whenever he did, he always won the battles, nonetheless, the tension of waiting for him was just too much. And so they wanted a king they could see. And uh, that was an act of treason on their part. And yet the amazing thing is that their real king, their true king, God still loved them still fought the battles for them, still turned up at the last moment when they needed him. And uh, we've seen that in the previous chapters, how God acts for them. You see, this is what God has to do all the time. He has to deal with messes. He has to deal with people like you and me. And our lives are often messy. Our obedience is often not what it should be. And even though we pray, we often don't pray. Even though we are committed to reading the Bible, most of us don't do it every day. We do it when we remember to do it, and that's not very often because we've got good forgetteries. We we just can't keep up with the things that we've got to remember and do, and we are not the people that we're meant to be. Life is messy. God's used to dealing with mess. So it isn't that Saul makes mistakes and that that means God is no longer working with him. Rather, something else is going on in the story that we have to we have to get our heads around. The end of chapter 12 is an example. Samuel comes to the children of Israel, and he reminds them why it was they have Saul. Because of their treason, because of their disobedience. Samuel spells it right out. We saw this last time. You can read it for yourself in chapter 12. He doesn't, he doesn't pretend. He doesn't fudge. He doesn't, he doesn't try to skirt the subject. He says, no, you were treasonous. You you did this against God. You didn't want God as king, so you wanted Saul as king instead. God understands that. But I'm saying to you today, here's Samuel, saying to the children of Israel, I'm saying to today, that was then, today is now. If from this point onwards you follow the Lord, if from this point onwards, guess what? God will forget 
the treason. And if you and your king keep God's word, there's only blessing in the future, only blessing in the future, if you and your king will from this point on follow after the Lord. That's how gracious God is. God deals with the messiness of our lives, and he cuts us a break over and over and over again. He doesn't immediately punish sin in any of our lives. He is gracious, long-suffering, patient, and we find that in the story of Saul. But one of the things we have to learn, and this is important because I think it's part of the rationale of faith, that, that God is also God who keeps His threats as well as His promises. If He didn't, supposing God never kept His threats, then you and I would have to doubt whether or not God would ever come through with His promises. If He never kept His threats. And in the Bible, by the way, He holds back His threats for hundreds of years. With Israel, for example. If he never came through with his threats, then how could we ever believe him for his promises? At the end of chapter 12, after giving them a great promise that uh, God would be with them and uh, all they had to do was to fear the Lord and serve him with all their heart, considering the great things that he's done for you, there's this little clause at the very end, but if you still do wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. Now in chapter 13, the rot sets in. Let me remind you of the job description that Saul had. When he was given the job as king, there were a number of specifics that God gave. First of all, God was not making him into a king like the nations roundabout, which is what the people wanted. In the nations roundabout, kings did pretty much as they chose to do. They had total power. They could do whatever they wanted. They could go to war or not go to war as they pleased. But Israel's king was to be a kind of vice king, like a vice president. God was to be the king of Israel and the human king was to always, only, ever act in obedience to the word and will of God. That was the first thing. The second thing is that, that this vice king was to do a specific job. He was to save Israel from a specific enemy called the Philistines. That was his job description. Right from the very beginning. And, and Samuel, who was the prophet, when he was appointing Saul, reminded him of this. God wants to put you apart, and he's going to use you to save Israel from the Philistines. Now, by this point in the story, Saul has done sweet all about the Philistines. Really, he's done nothing. Right at the very beginning of the story, when he was appointed, Samuel said to Saul, he said, you know, you're going home. On your way home, you're going to pass a Philistine garrison that is in Israelite territory near your hometown. Implication, God's called you to save Israel from the Philistines. Maybe you should do something about it. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Time passes. Nothing happens. Then somebody comes from the Philistines were in the west. From the east, the Ammonites, another bunch of people with unpronounceable names, come from the east, and they start to attack Israel, and they do a terrible thing. And this time, Saul acts. It's a great, it's his high moment. This is his high point. You can read about this in chapter 11, where he, Saul defeats the Ammonites and does it roundly. Not only does he defeat the Ammonites, which is good, he actually gives all the credit to God, which is good, and he says some amazing things about God being the Savior who comes into the rescue of his people, which is very good. And uh, he submits to the Word of God through Samuel the prophet. That's very, very good. In chapter 12, his scorecard is doing really well. He's got all full points for everything. He's, he's a model of the coming king, King Jesus. But he's still done nothing about this. Philistines. 
So you come to chapter 13, and it starts with a battle against the Philistines by someone called Jonathan. We're not told who it is at the beginning of the story. That tent, we're in the tension of telling the narrative, we're not told till later on. But you know it's that Jonathan is Saul's son, so there's no point in me trying to pretend or to keep the, the tension going, because you already know the answer as to who he is. But we're not told who he is at this point, just that somebody else deals with that garrison near Saul's hometown, and it's Jonathan. Jonathan gets some men together, and he goes over and attacks the Philistines and defeats them, defeats the Philistines that were at Geba. Only Saul gets the credit, because he's the king. And the king controls the spin doctors and the message that gets out. So we're told that all Israel heard, it said, that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines. That's the way you do it when you're in charge of the press releases. All Israel heard of it, and the Philistines heard of it. And there's an ominous sign. They're going to be ticked off when they discover that someone has invaded this little garrison killed the uh, soldiers that were guarding it, and uh, destroyed and chased away these Philistines that were in Israel. Well, that's what precipitates the action. Now the Philistines are hopping mad. They're coming with a great army, and Saul is now afraid. And he calls a general call to arms. Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews here. Very strange way of referring to the children of Israel. Usually it was their enemies that called them the Hebrews. They did it disparagingly. I don't know why here Saul uses this word when he tells the Hebrews, the Jews, the, the Israelites to gather. But so far, so good. So far, so good in another sense, in that Saul then gathers the people together to Gilgal. Now, some of you are going to sleep just now and you're saying, I don't want all this geopolitical, historical stuff. But if you hold on just a minute, it will become clear. If it doesn't become clear, you get your money back. Uh, <laughs> Saul gathers all, all the Israelites to Gilgal. Now, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance of that was that here was the second thing. Remember, the first thing was that a king in Israel was not to be like the other nations in that he was to be like a vice king under God. Here was the second thing. It was the only command specific command that he was given as a king in his official royal capacity that kind of worked out what being a vice king of God would look like in real life. In real life, this is what he was told. If ever there's a foreign power attacks you, if ever you find yourself pressed with an enemy, what you have to do is you have to go to Gilgal. Now, Gilgal was a remote area, pretty safe area. While you were there, you were far away from any of your enemies. They're all in the outskirts. They're quite, you know, so it was a good place to be if you're going to be anywhere with your army. It's a pretty safe, secure place. Go to Gilgal, wait there until Samuel comes. Seven days, Samuel will come. And bring the Word of God to you, and God will tell you what you should do, or you should fight the enemy. Now, that was a good thing to do, because most of the time, whenever God did that, do you know what? The army didn't have to do anything. The army of Israel just turned up, and somehow or other, there was confusion among the enemies, or the enemies started fighting each other, or something else happened, and the army of Israel just went, turned up, got the glory and the praise for fighting the battle and winning the war, and they'd done nothing. That's usually what happened. So, he does what he's told to do. The, the command is in chapter 10, verse 8, go down before me, this is Samuel talking, to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming to you to offer burnt offerings, to offer sacrifice, peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Now, when you read this chapter 13, Saul remembers that command. So, you can't say he's forgotten this. I read one commentator earlier this morning who said, that uh, this has nothing to do with this original command, because it probably happened years before. Do you know what I've forgotten to do? I've forgotten to explain this mistranslation of these ESV translators in verse 1. In this summary of the years, the days, and the, all the rest of it. And uh, it's not the right time to do it now, so it's passed. The moment has gone. The Hebrew, by the way, the Hebrew of chapter 13, verse 1, reads like this. Saul was son of a year when he reigned, and two years he reigned over Israel. 
And the reason they don't do anything with it is that son of a year normally refers to a crown prince's birth. And uh, Saul is a grown man by this stage, probably in his 40s. He's got a son who can lead a detachment of troops against the enemy, so he's no, he's no spring chicken. But the, the, the interesting thing is that Saul was crown prince for a year. He was potentially crown prince for a year because he was appointed by Samuel in secret to be a prince over Israel and then recognized publicly sometime later, possibly a year later, by all the nation. And the likelihood is that the two-year reference is that from the point at which he became king to the point at which he was rejected as king was possibly only a period of two years. Okay? That's the official line. Back to our exciting story. Saul has now gathered the people to Gilgal, and he feels under pressure. That's why he's done it. Do you notice the pressure that he felt under? The men of Israel saw this great amassing of armies and armaments against them, and, that they, and they knew that they were in trouble. That's what it says. Israel saw they were in trouble. They were in trouble because the people were hard-pressed. Here's the reason they were hard-pressed. The Philistines now had two advantages. They outnumbered them. In fact, the phrase that they were as numerous as the sand on the seashore was a terrifying number. This was a promise God had given that Israel would one day be as numerous as the sand on the seashore, but now it's the Philistines who are that numerous. There's just thousands of them. They're all over the place. And secondly, not only that, but they have a corner on the arms market. They have the smiths. They have the, uh, the, the necessary metals to make armaments. And guess what? They weren't allowing anybody in Israel to do that, to have the weapons or, or to have a smithy or, or to be able to, to forge weapons. So they had all the weapons. And in fact, only two people in the entire Israelite army had any weapons at all, and that was Saul and Jonathan. So it was, you know, they were outgunned and outnumbered. But they were in a safe place. They were in Gilgal. And the people now had started to melt away. They were hiding themselves in caves and holes and of the rocks and in tombs and cisterns. They were even leaving Israel altogether and going across the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead to get away from the pressure that was coming on them. Now that's the background. Samuel, or Saul rather, is under pressure. But he does what Samuel told him for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. But as the seventh day wears on, Saul is feeling under even more pressure. Everybody's leaving. The people are just melting away. He's down to about 600 people, and he's facing an army of tens of thousands of people. I mean, 600 was more than Gideon had when Gideon fought the Philistines with 300 and beat them all without having to use the sword. But Saul is a kind of anti-Gideon figure in this because now he's down to 600 men, and now he panics at the last minute. And he says, bring the burnt offering to me and the peace offerings. And he offered, halfway through the thing, he offers the burnt offering. And he tells us, verse 12, he did it to gain the favor of the Lord to fight the Philistines. And what Saul does, you need to notice, is a simple act of disobedience. Impatience but disobedience. It's just like Adam in the garden. Adam's sin was just a simple matter of obedience. Adam in the garden had one command, and he broke it. Saul as king had one command, and he broke it. And the parallels are important. Earlier on in the story, when Saul is first introduced to us, there were a number of people after he had been appointed king who were going around asking themselves questions about Saul. They were asking the question, who is his father? They're not, it's not his biological father. That was his spiritual father, his mentor, his uh, advisor, his guide. What they were really asking was, who does Saul listen to? There was once a president of the United States, and one of the comments that was made about this particular president was that he got himself into trouble because there was no one that he listened to. 
He had all kinds of people in his cabinet and so forth, but he never took them seriously. And he got the nation into trouble for a period. So the question was asked, who does he listen to? Does he listen to the Word of God? Does he listen to Samuel the prophet, who is the spokesman of God? Well, he goes ahead in disobedience, and at the very moment, halfway through the sacrifices, he's got through one half, he's gone into the next half, Samuel turns up. King Saul was glad to see him. I think he probably braved it out. He probably marched forward. Tallest man in all Israel marched forward, looking down on little Samuel, and shook his hand and said, really glad you turned up. Where have you been? We're just getting ready to attack the Philistines. And Samuel says to him, what have you done? It echoes the language of God outside the Garden of Eden as he comes to Adam after his disobedience, and God says to Adam, what have you done? Or the language of God speaking to Cain after he's murdered his brother, what have you done? Or the language of God to Achan, the guy who had uh, foraged and stolen materials from the city of Jericho when Israel is, is entering the promised land and brought chaos and carnage to the children of Israel, and they said to him, what have you done? What have you done, Saul? What have you done? When we know later from the story that, that Samuel loves this man, Saul. He can't believe it. What have you done? And what's Saul's response? He plays the blame game. When I saw the people scattering, the people going, and you didn't come, he even blames Samuel. And now the Philistines will come against me at Gilgal. He blames the people, he blames Samuel, he's now blaming the Philistines for just being there and being the enemy. He's blaming everybody, but he doesn't take any responsibility himself. Who, who does he sound like? Well, he sounds like King Adam, right at the very beginning of the Bible story, remember? He blames his wife and God for giving him Mrs. Adam. The woman you gave to me. I mean, a moment before, he thought the woman was superwoman. She was. She had the best genetic makeup of any woman that lived. Guys, keep your imaginations in check. You're in church. <laughs> but he blames her, and then she blames the serpent. That's the way it goes. And the reason you do that, of course, is you don't want to accept responsibility yourself. But listen to him. Listen to him. He then goes on to argue that what he did, he did reluctantly. Well, there we were. The people were running away. Everybody was scared. I felt the responsibility on myself. I'm the, I'm the uh, chief of staff, the commanding officer of uh, the Israelite armies. So everybody's going. The time is dragging on. The day is wearing old. You didn't turn up. So I just forced myself you know, the chocolate cake was on the table. I'm on a diet, but there it was. I forced myself to take a slice. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Often we force ourselves into sin. We just force ourselves to do it. There it is. The opportunity's there. And on we go. And we say, I didn't really have any other option, actually. No other option. Very often... This is what I think this lesson is. One of the lessons of this chapter is teaching us is we find ourselves in pressing circumstances where we persuade ourselves that we have no other alternative than to do what we know is sin against God. No Falling Word features the teaching of Dr. Liam Gallagher and is produced by the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. Liam is the pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Center City, Philadelphia. And if you enjoy listening to his messages here on this radio program, you'll love hearing from him live at 10th Presbyterian. Stop by 17th and Spruce Streets for services every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. In the powerful message entitled Sola Gratia, meaning grace alone, Dr. Carl Truman shares the amazing truth about God's free gift of salvation. Today we're offering a complimentary copy of this resource to anyone listening to the program right now. 
A free MP3 download of Sola Gratia is yours when you simply call us at 1-800-488-1888. Let us know you'd like your free copy of today's gift for listeners, and we'll get you access to your own free download of that message. We love being able to give away free resources. We think of it as our way of saying, thanks for tuning in. Remember that this radio program relies on listener support to stay on the air and remain commercial free. So we are certainly grateful for you, our faithful listeners and generous partners in this ministry. When you call in at 1-800-488-1888, ask how you can make a one-time gift or even become part of our monthly support team. Or get online at nofallingword.org to make a secure donation there. While you're on our site, Take some time to browse around the extensive online library of Reformed resources from many of your favorite Bible teachers. Whether you're looking for a new book for yourself or some audio CDs to give to friends and family as Christmas gifts, you'll find it all right there on our site. And as always, we invite you to tell your friends and church family about this weekly broadcast of No Falling Word as well. Ask them to join you in tuning in next week. Join us again next week for a special Thanksgiving broadcast of No Falling Word. We'll take a break from our series through Samuel to hear a message from Liam with a surprisingly provocative title, Why Being Unthankful Can Send You to Hell.